Okay, so uh, again, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone who's also joining us from so many different parts of the world. Um, in addition to the places I mentioned, now we have France and we have South Africa and different places. It's uh, in different time zones. Thank you for joining us, especially those who are joining us um, in the middle of the night um, in their different places. Um, our topic today, as you know, today's topic is um, defeat and the future. My name is Samir Asmer. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley, and along with my colleague and friend, Natalia Brozuela, I'm also the co-PI for the grant that funds the projects of the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs, the host of today's event. This event is the second in a series of conversations about four topics that will be at the center of some of the consortium's events over the next few years. These topics are ecology and forms of life, debt and questions of care, camps, borders, and hospitality. And the fourth topic, today's topic, is defeat and the future. By bringing together scholars, activists, and artists from different parts of the world, parts of the world that have experienced and continue to experience devastation and destruction, but also ongoing struggles for other futures, our hope is that these conversations will generate creative and critical vocabularies that could guide us through the impasses of our times. The International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs is generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Office of, Vice, um, of the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Berkeley. And we thank them for their commitment to the consortium and its projects. I want to also thank the members of the consortium team, as well as the members of the Center uh, for Interdisciplinary Research here at UC Berkeley for all the work they have done to set up and help run today's event and other events we're hosting. In particular, I want to thank Brianna George, Miranda Schonbrunn, Patricia Donop, and Tim Wyman McCarthy for their impeccable work. A few words about the topic of today's conversation. Several places in the world have been contending with experiences of defeat. Defeat has been the outcome or the experience of various emancipatory aspirations, revolutions and rebellions, strikes against the exploitation of resources and lives, and struggles for economic and racial justice. Defeat has also has been the experience of many of these struggles and others, as they have been contend, uh, confronting colonial powers, capitalist and racial uh, and racist logics and forces, military occupiers, oppressive states, the international community, and many other forces. One response has been to bracket defeat in the effort to strengthen the struggles to overcome it. Another has been to recognize defeat, but only in order to critically investigate the powers that engender it. Consequently, the particular political experience of defeat, its multiple itineraries and histories, and its unexpected consequences are rarely given reflective consideration. This conversation between scholars of Cuba and the Arab world clears space for the critical theorization of defeat and its relationship to the future. What political, aesthetic, and ethical practices have been pursued in the course of contending with different experiences of defeat? And how are we to think a relationship to the future or relationships to the future from the present and past of ongoing, from the past and present of ongoing defeats? These are the general threads of our conversation today. And I will now introduce the speakers all at once and then we can begin our conversation. We have with us Fadi Bardawil. Fadi Bardawil is Assistant Professor of Contemporary Arab Cultures in the Department of Asian Studies and Middle East Studies at Duke University. An anthropologist by training, his research investigates the international circulation of critical theory, the genealogies of post-colonial critique, and the traditions of intellectual inquiry and political engagement of contemporary Arab thinkers. His writings have appeared in Boundary 2, Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, 
the Journal for Palestine Studies, Dirasat Palestinia, Arabic edition, Jadalia Al Jumhuria, The Eminent Frame, Cultura Ustach, Megaphone, and South Atlantic Quarterly. He is the author of Revolution and Disenchantment, Arab Marxism and the Binds of Emancipation 2020. Paloma Duong is Assistant Professor of Latin American and Media Studies as MIT, at MIT, where she researches and teaches modern and contemporary Latin American cultures at the intersection of cultural studies, media theory, and political philosophy. She works with those social texts and emergent media cultures that speak to the exercise of cultural agencies and the formation of political subjectivities. She is currently writing Portable Post-Socialisms, Cuban Mediascapes After the End of History, a book-length study of Cuba's changing media and cultural landscape that is also an inquiry into the global post-socialist condition, a time when the death of socialism coexists with the rise of anti-capitalist movements. Her articles have appeared in the Journal of Latin American Cultural Studies, Art Margins, Revista Hispanica Moderna, and Cuban Counterpoints. Nuri Ghana is Associate Professor of Comparative Literature and Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA. He has published numerous articles and chapters on the literatures and cultures of the Arab world and its diasporas in such scholarly venues as cultural politics, PMLA, representations, and social text. He is the author of Signifying Loss Toward the Poetics of Narrative Mourning, 2011, and the editor of the Edinburgh Companion to the Arab Novel in English, 2013, as well as The Making of the Tunisian Revolution, Contexts, Architects, Prospects, 2013. He recently completed a book manuscript titled Melancholy Acts, Defeat and Cultural Critique in the Arab World. Welcome everyone, good to have you with us. Before we start the conversation, I should let you know that you can share with us your questions using that Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Please do not use the chat tab, but the Q&A tab on your Zoom screen. We will leave plenty of time for discussion following this moderated conversation. So everyone welcome and let me begin with first question, a general question. Um, and we'll begin with Fadi and then Paloma and then Nuri. Speaking from the sites that you're thinking about, from Cuba to North Africa, to the Mashriq, to the Middle East, the sites of struggle, emancipatory and socialist aspirations, and struggles against military colonial occupations. How has defeat been articulated and reckoned with in these sites, if at all? So let's begin with Fadi. Thank you, uh, Samara and Natalia, so much for extending the invitation to have the conversation with Nuri and Paloma about defeat and the future. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Let me, uh, let me try and address your first question through um, thinking a bit um, generally about the constellation of concepts that revolve in the orbit of defeat. And I'm, I've sort of tried to think about these concepts. I'm just gonna state them now. Uh, based on the archival work, the ethnographic work I've done around, uh, in particular, the 1967 uh, defeat of the Arab armies against Israel and the cultural political effervescence that happened in its wake. I will say more about the form of the cultural production and intellectual practice that happened later on, but let me start by thinking about really what is it that defeat is about and i think it's it's very it's it's a it's a concept that's good to think with but it's also not an easy concept to 
to to basically uh, to grasp. And you know, if you do a basic search on uh, on a library catalog and you uh, plug in defeat in the title, what you get mostly is military defeats and defeats that have to do with nations. So the uh, defeat of Japan and Second World War or you know Napoleonic Wars, etc. But if you dig deeper and you realize that the concept of defeat straddles basically two kind of registers. One is an ethico-political register and the other one is a, a psycho-affective one. And I'm gonna try and sort of put on the table some of the concepts that are that have to do with, with basically these two registers, uh, the ethico-political one and the psycho-affective one. Um, here they are, denial, scapegoating or displacement, betrayal, conspiracy, honor. These are really concepts that are mobilized and have been mobilized in the uh, uh, sort of setting and in the wake of 67. Uh, these are coupled sometimes with uh, feelings of humiliation, uh, guilt, shame, a sense of shattering, trauma, bereavement, anger, but also relief, anguish, despair. I know, I know this is a lot, but it's trying to literally, in a way, get a sense of the of the concepts that revolve again around in the, in this orbit. Uh, a third set that have to do, I think, with the sort of the wake of defeat. Uh, you know, you get things that vary from suicide to taking stop and responsibility to repentance, atonement, melancholia, mourning, narcissistic wounds, uh, a discovery, recovery of identity, uh, steadfastness, which is uh, the translation usually in English given to the Arabic concept of sumud, but also uh, defeat has always been deployed around the discourses of uh, of education that move beyond the sort of taking stock. So, you know, lessons from the defeat, lessons of the defeat. A defeat is always an, a good educational opportunity, so to speak. Uh, so this is one thing that I wanted to put on the table, which is in a way the, the complexity of trying to think with defeat and the range of concepts that are around it. There's a second main point I wanna, try and address uh, regarding your, uh, your, you know, uh, question about defeat. And that has to do mostly with uh, the traditions of the left that I work with. And so there is something that has to do in leftist traditions with the relationship of defeat to epistemology. There is, on, on the one hand, a, a sense that the vanquished, the defeated, have some kind of searing insight into things. Like defeat gives the vanquished a critical edge of sorts. One that sometimes is coupled by a moral superiority that comes from, from the result of suffering. We have suffered, we have endured, and therefore, in a way, we have a sense of moral superiority, but we can actually see through. We have we see through things in the way that the victors uh, cannot. But then again, uh, someone like Theodore Adorno in uh, *Minima Moralia* has this line where he says that it is in the nature of the defeated to appear in their impotence as irrelevant, eccentric, derisory. So there is there is a way there is a tension in which one can sort of speak about the heroism of defeat that that comes sometimes with the romanticization of the defeated and the endowment of a particular critical insight to that to that position and that other position which basically Adorno sort of talks you know talks about that's one point the second point i want to make has to do with the certain the what Russell Jacobi in a very, very interesting book called The Dialectic of, the, of Defeat, which was published around 1980, called the, the kind of ethos of success that drives 
a big segment of the Marxist tradition. And by that, he meant that, you know, Marxism was compelling because it's because for people who were proponents of it, it was accurate, but also because it was successful. So in a way, success becomes the proof of the truth of Marxism itself. So that is a position which is in tension with the other one, because here what you have is, you know, the left being on the side of basically success, on the side, on the side of, on the side of victory. And, and in that tradition, what you have is that a collapse of conceptual truth onto political victory. I mean, in, in, you know, in, in Jacobi, in Jacobi's uh, rendering of that sort of ethos of success that drove the left uh, over the years, he has a very interesting point where he says that, you know, the way in which this approach immunized itself against tr criticism is by constantly shifting its object, i.e., who is, you know, who is the successful revolutionary subject you know, this year around. It could be, you know, Maoism, but it could be then the prison movement, then it could be the working class, it could be minorities. So it is, you, you, there's always, he says, you know, uh, militant intellectuals and militants that are, are on the hunt for successful revolutions to align themselves with. Uh, so, so there is a tension to sort of, you know, there's, there's a tension between you know, about the vanquished political has basically sought to collapse concept. And was one thing, which is, uh, which, uh, which is a very, I think, crucial point that, uh, that sort of Adorno uh, make. Can you hear me? I got a comment that I'm breaking up. Yeah. So, so let me, let me, yeah, let me end well, with, with up, something Daddy. from that same section. I just wanted to say, you sorry, are I, up. I couldn't hear you now. You I, I am breaking, breaking up. You, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. You know, so if you can, yeah, conclude your thoughts. Right. Don't worry about it. Yeah, one last thing, which which uh, I think it's important to mention, which is uh, Adorno's comment uh, on Benjamin in Minima Muralia, and I'll finish by by reading that because I'm gonna come back to it later. Uh, so uh, here I'm I'm citing and I'm reading I'm reading Adorno's uh, comment. So he says, if Benjamin said that history has had hitherto been written from the standpoint of the victor and needed to be written from that of the vanquished. We might add that knowledge must indeed present the fatally rectilinear succession of victory and defeat. But here's Adorno's point, which I think is crucial, but should address itself to those things which were not embraced by this dynamic, mm -hmm. which fall by the wayside, what might be called the waste products and blind spots that have escaped the dialectic, that dialectic being that of victory and defeat. And I will come back later, I think, to thinking about what's, what are these waste products, the blind spots that are not captured by just thinking about victory and defeat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fadi. This was a um, wonderful, wonderful way to open up also the conversation here. Um, Paloma, would you like to... Yeah. Of course, and thanks everybody for being here. And thanks, Fadi. That was actually a perfect um, uh, intro because for me, for example, my my project, uh, I usually defeat, but by triumph, by victory in the face of global political defeat after 1989-91, depending how we periodize the fall of the socialist bloc. And Cuba is a site widely considered to be a survivor of that defeat, the one exception to that collapse, to the capitulation to the market, even as in China or Vietnam. So just in many ways, the same way it was thought to be an exceptional event in the early 60s at the height of destalinization as a Western humanist alternative um, to the Soviet 
union. So, so my challenge uh, is rather how to define the site uh, as, a, as a site in relation to defeat here. And where, where I, where the, the, with the, with the, um, um, what I'm working with are narratives about Cuban post-socialism or Cuban post-socialism as a set of competing narratives uh, that emerge in contemporary cultural media production, uh, but also with Cuban socialism as a media archive that circulates globally in a specific historical moment. Um, so, so I'm interested in really mapping the exchanges um, between the post-socialist uh, context in Cuba and the global post-socialist condition as this time in which the defeat of socialism, of 20th century socialism, coexists with the resurgence of anti-capitalist ethos, especially after the financial crisis of 2000 and in Latin America with the rise and fall of the so-called pink tide governments, right? So from this perspective, there's a disjuncture that appears, um, I would argue, between the post-socialist condition, the global post-socialist condition, and the Cuban post-socialist context, which was evident to me in the link between two apparently divergent phenomena while I was uh, researching. Uh, and, and so on one hand, we have that at the turn of the 21st century Cuban socialism, its signifiers, its legacies, um, have been reactivated as an international object of political desire in the post-socialist moment. But at the same time, the global market has become a national object of desire in post-socialist Cuba. So for instance, while the Communist Party aggressively courts foreign capital investment, and while Cubans rely on informal and small non-state economies, the reactivation of Cuba as an international object of desire elsewhere um, was nowhere more evident than in the reaction I always got when I presented myself as a Cuban researcher, as a Cuban, and I always got this Cuba, I want to go before it changes. So I think, uh, so that was key for me, this globally mediated identity of Cuba as a land frozen in time, as the last bastion of 20th century socialism, as a survivor of that collapse. Um, and I was interested in um, how this is directly tied to the question of competing narratives of defeat and its opposite of triumph or victory. Um, perhaps a little bit of what Fadi was talking about and the success um, of the Marxist traditions. And I, um, what I argue is that these uh, competing narratives um, that we have to contend with um, are, are represent in many ways the different constituencies, and I and I want to uh, use that word on purpose, both domestic and foreign, of the 1959 Cuban Revolution, because now a quick answer to the desire to go to Cuba before it changes would be, well, it has already changed, or to dismiss that desire as an expression of naive political tourism or the repetition of a certain colonial gaze even. But I'm interested in taking these desires and this political imaginary seriously um, as a symptom of the post-socialist condition by asking how that desire is built on a canonic media archive, on narratives of exceptionality and victory and survival against all odds, and, and on legitimate political investments, because uh, modern revolutions are global events in the strict sense in which Wallerstein's, what Wallerstein argues they are. Um, so I argue that, that narratives about what exactly triumphed in 1959 and what has survived since as Cuban socialism and their cultural media representations hinge among other things on the failure of the left in general and of the new left in particular um, in critically engaging with actually existing socialism in the Cuban case. And so we're still very much knee deep in what Stuart Hall called the crisis of the left vis-a-vis -vis the apparent defeat of socialism elsewhere. So one question that, that, that for me uh, derives from this uh, is, well, how do we rethink defeat and victory in the post-socialist moment from and with the post-socialist context. That is, how uh, do we understand both the post-socialist condition redefined as a time of searching for vocabularies critical of the neoliberal present, critical of the communist past, but also how do we think from the post-socialist context defined as the place where the direct experience and memory of 20th century state socialisms still organize cultural, political, and social imaginaries. So this is the question that uh, comes um, for me from my work and from the question you pose, Samira. So. Uh, 
I will repeat. Thank you, Paloma. Thank you so much uh, for this. Um, Nuri. And unmute yourself when you can. Oh, sorry about that. I was just thanking you and thanking Natalia uh, for um, putting this together and for uh, inviting me to be part of it. And I'm very happy to be in conversation with Fadi and uh, Paloma on defeat and the future. Um, so I'll, I'll start um, saying a few things um, by way of answering your first question. Um, the way I came to think about this was um, around my um, first book project, which um, examined the, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Fadi for that introduction because he brought, uh, he brought together all the concepts that uh, um, really revolve around the question of defeat. So one of them was uh, obviously the question of loss. And, uh, you know, my first project was really um, somewhat like a, um, um, an examination of that concept and the way it is figured um, across modernist post-colonial and uh, the Arabic uh, modernist traditions. And the last chapter of that book was really on the uh, Lebanese civil war and on um, a, a little novella, but very, very actually insightful novella by Elias Khoury um, uh, called, you know, the city gates or Abwab al Madina. And, um, you know, I, I actually, um, um, that, that actually last chapter of that book was pretty much the bridge to the uh, current book project, which I just finished and which you, you mentioned in your introduction. And um, since then I've been thinking about um, the ways in which um, <clears throat> the question of loss is actually also related uh, in the particular case of the Arab world to uh, the defeat of um, 67, but even before that, of course, the Nakba of 48 and um, all the questions that, uh, that came after that. And as a framework, I have always been, um, been actually intrigued by uh, this conversation in, uh, in the Battle of Algiers between, um, <clears throat> between Larbi Mhidi, who was uh, an FLN activist, and um, of course the journalist when he was uh, cap captured actually by mistake. And he was asked whether the FLN uh, has any chance um, of, of actually defeating the French army. And the answer was, uh, I, I can play the clip if you want me to. Um, I don't know whether um, we have time for that. But anyway, I mean, if, 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 if later on I can play the clip because it's, it's online anyway. So um, uh, he was asked the question whether the FLN has any chance of defeating the French army. And that answer uh, he gave, um, the FLN has more of a chance of defeating the French army than the French have of changing the course of history. Um, that, that type of answer has actually haunted me, especially in, in the context of the Arab world where the defeat of 67 was seen by many, uh, and particularly by somebody like George Tarabishi, as, as the kind of defeat that has expelled the Arabs out of history altogether. And so um, um, philosophically, you know, th that opened up, um, that opened up, um, you know, for me, a very um, 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 uh, like, like the space to to really uh, grapple with the question of um, agency, subjectivity, and history, and how you know um, uh, we we are actually subjects uh, of history, and how we make our own history, and then of course that resonates with um, with um, um, something that um, C.L.R. James, for instance, has mentioned in uh, the Black Jacobins, which is uh, great men make their own history, but it's uh, but it uh, make their own history, but only such a history that is possible for them to make, which is itself a remake of you know what Marx has said in the 18th Brumaire. So in, in a sense, you, you know, I found myself um, in that in that space of um, in that space of possibility and that space of coercion and conscription at the same time, and and I at the same time also I was uh, really uh, intrigued by uh, Daniel Ben Said, which uh, book which has not actually for some reason been translated into English. Uh, it's called Le Paris Melancolique, um, the the melancholic. Well, how do I say uh, the, the melancholic maybe wager? Uh, wager, uh, yeah. Yeah, as a possible translation. So, and one of the things he says there is really um, 
this, um, I mean, the, the melancholic effect, just to add to what Fadi was saying about the uh, psychoaffective dimension of defeat is that uh, one of the things that um, Daniel Said mentions is that um, uh, this, this notion of melancholia emerges, um, he says, uh, in, uh, at, in the interface between um, you know, the necessary and the impossible. So something that is necessary, which is, for instance, in this case, or in the case of the Arab world, which is independent self-determination, especially, especially in the case of Palestine, uh, which also has become historically, realistically, you know, <laughs> given the facts of the, uh, on the ground, uh, you know, um, as they stand right now, has become quite impossible. And so it is the interplay uh, the, the, between the two that actually um, 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 result in the uh, emergence of the question of, um, uh, of melancholia. So I was thinking about that. Um, I mean, I, I'm just giving you the framework from which my, my you know, thinking about this topic um, come together. And of course, my first, my, my primary interest um, has been always to look at this question uh, through, of course, primarily as a literary critic and a comparatist, uh, primarily through literature and culture. Um, and then of course, you know, I'm interested in the philosoph philosophical aspects of it, but I think what I found really quite intriguing and this also, you know, Fadi <laughs> mentioned this, which is the ways in which, you know, the defeat uh, for instance, of 67. And of course, I mean, if we go back to the Battle of Algiers, uh, we see the ways in which, uh, you know, the, the defeat of the FLN, which, uh, you know, in, in that war uh, from 54 to, to 57. So the defeat of the FLN did not actually result in the defeat of the revolution. So, uh, you know, in the end, there was a popular uh, mass revolution, which ended, you know, with the uh, Algerian independence. So that defeat was not actually um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Hidi, Larbi Ben Hidi was right. That that you know um, that you know the, the, the defeat of the FLN did not change the course of history, which was uh, the uh, the course of the decolonization period or the decolonization age. I mean, what is intriguing about the question of, uh, for instance, the question of Palestine and the, the in '48 and then and then the defeat of '67? It's as if they were running counter history, you know, it's at that, the very moment we are in the decolonization age, we are in that course of history, which cannot be, uh, you know, reversed, according to Ben Mahidi, of course, all of a sudden, we see uh, the reverse course taking place, in, in, you know, we have the Nakba in 48, and then, and then 67, which has, uh, you know, aggravated the situation. So for me, uh, the question was really how to, uh, to think through through, through that and how to think uh, with history and, and, and of course, to a certain extent, grapple with it in order to come to a certain understanding. Um, and I think what I found was that really, um, do I still have time for this or? One minute, okay. So um, I'll just say a few more words about, you know, my, my broad interests in, um, in the uh, literary and cultural aspects. And I think one of the things that I found, and I'll say more about this, uh, later, is that, um, um, you know, the defeat, of course, of 67 was called the Naksa, and as you can see, uh, I'll, I can come back later to, to the Nakba, but the, the, it was called the Naksa, which um, was, a, a, was really a concept uh, coined by um, um, Heikel, who was a journalist uh, very close to Nasser. And then I, I think the word Naksa, which means a setback, does not really um, give much of a reckoning or an acknowledgement of the uh, really of the, the al hazima which is you know uh, in arabic which is the defeat actually so um, so there was some kind of a, a displacement of of the enormity of the event uh, itself so there was that kind of denial um, at the outset especially you know at the level of um, you know the level of um, politics and uh, and governance etc and you do not find that actually in the literature. Uh, when we read, um, you know, the, the poets who responded, like for instance, Lizar Qabbani or later on Mahmoud Darwish uh, and Adonis and others, um, when we read through the literature, the, you know, that uh, there is a reckoning. There is a reckoning with the enormity of what happened, you know, and the crisis it brought about. So, so literature provided that space. I mean, this is just to say this by way of introduction. I think, you know, literature and culture, we'll see later on the ways in which the defeat really has affected itself, you know, the cultural space and the ways in which artists actually practice culture in the aftermath of defeat. But one of the first things is that, you know, literature 
and culture opened up that space where it is possible actually to speak about defeat without being in a sense you know um, uh, ashamed or you know or held in self-denial so it is a space of working through let's put it this way and I'll, I'll end with that i'll say more later on with specific uh, examples because i know this may work better with uh, specific examples thank you nori if you could um stop the sharing yes Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. I mean, this was um, a good, good really beginning of our discussion in particular in the ways in which you have, first of all, opened up the concept, placed it next to other competing concepts, but also discussed the stakes of, um, of what is at stake really in calling something, classifying something or calling it defeat or associating it with defeat. Stakes, ethical, political, um, and sometimes personal and psychic. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy for this introduction. And so maybe we can go perhaps for more. Um, and, and of course you've spoken from different sites from Cuba and Palestine for the Arab world was central for both uh, for for Nuri's intervention and also in the background of Fadi's intervention. Um, so the second question that I'd like to raise is, uh, and you're welcome to address whatever parts um, speaks to your uh, research or to your thinking, I should say. And it's the following: um, What political actions, aesthetic practices, or affects? have characterized or emerged from the experience of contending with defeat or the aftermath of defeat? And has defeat resulted um, in rethinking the relationship to the past or to history? And in what ways and with what implications? We can perhaps start again with Fadi and then go to Paloma and Nuri. Okay. Uh, thank you, Samira. I'd like to sort of uh, build on uh, what Nuri ended with because I think it's we're both trying to sort of you know even if from working with different archives think through the different afterlives of uh, 1967 in in one way or another you know which uh, was uh, described in like journals of military history as literally like a lightning war a blitzkrieg that basically in a few days defeated uh, the, Arab, the Arab armies. And uh, Nuri put on the table the question of uh, Nexa, which was basically, uh, uh, as he mentioned, coined by uh, Haikal, who was the advisor of President Abdel Nasser. And President Abdel Nasser, in his resignation speech, used that word, setback, which, uh, and I am in agreement uh, fully with Nuri when he said that this was uh, in a way, a denial of the en enormity of of the defeat. So to say this is to actually uh, put on the table the question of uh, the semantics of defeat, like the different meaning it acquires and how there is, there is in a way, uh, there's nothing, at least in the case of the modern Arab world, and I'll say more about that starting from Nuri's discussion of 67, the question of who is defining, what is being defined, and who is the subject of defeat itself was an open and conflicting space of argument. So, so the new left intellectuals insisted on calling it a defeat as opposed to a setback. Nexa, which was one, one way of distancing themselves. But then uh, part of the new left, which had emerged in the mid 60s, uh, which is that uh, it was called the new left because it did not re revolve in the Soviet orbit in the way in which uh, the older communist parties did. And also because a lot of it uh, came out of uh, multiple experiences within the Arab nationalist movement, whether the Ba'ath or the Arab nationalist movements, who at successive stages got more and more radical and moved, so to speak, their analysis from nation to class. And that new left insisted on calling it uh, the defeat of the regimes. 
This is very important because the subject of defeat here is not Arab culture, is not the, you know, the Arab squa people. It is, the subject is the post-colonial regimes that came to basically rule the Arab world. So, so not only, you know, not only is what do you call the event in a way part, uh, part and parcel of a conflict, Naksa, Nakba, Hazima, setback, you know, catastrophe, defeat, but also who do you attribute it to is also something which was uh, important. This is all, by the way, uh, so to sort of think about, to think about these questions is to actually say that defeat and particularly the 1967 defeat in the Arab world was tremendously productive and generative. So to think, not to think about the defeat only as a negative event, but to think of it as basically an, an event that sort of generates. And amongst, you know, apart from these conversations, what, what took place in the wake, you know, you're asking Samara about like, uh, some po political aftermath. So the new left, for example, one of the theories that they sort of called for in the wake of calling this uh, defeat of the regimes is that they called for a shift in the different modalities of engagement and militancy against Israel. So mm -hmm. they said the standard armies have lost, they were defeated, therefore we should move towards uh, people's war, towards, towards guerrilla-like tactics. So, so in a way, the modes themselves of militancy in the wake of defeat basically were argued to be, to be shifted from the state to the people, from organized warfare to guerrilla warfare. Now that, I'm mentioning that because I think that in the back one can read what I mentioned earlier about the ethos of success in the back of these arguments. Because we are 10 years, you know, so to speak, after the Cuban revolution, we are in the middle of the Vietnam War and people are thinking about what works and what doesn't work. And armies don't work, but guerrilla forces are working. Uh, so uh, Guevara, you know, Castro, Vietnam, this is all working. So they're arguing for that. And this was part and parcel of a big conversation. I mean, the distinguished uh, Syria, a Syrian uh, Marxist, Yassin al-Hafiz, wrote a very interesting book on what he called the, basically the Vietnamese experiment, arguing that its replication in the Arab world is not that feasible. Uh, so, so in a way, what one can think of in thinking about the wake of, of the defeat is thinking about two, two things which I think are important. One is the language of models, which assumes uh, total commensurability, like the Vietnamese model, the Cuban model. Okay, because you want to substitute something that was defeated with something that was successful. But the more uh, complex argument is not the language of modeling, which basically assumes full commensurability and, and transparency, but the language that I did some work on, which is about translation. Mm -hmm. So translation is not the application of a model, but rather it's basically the question of moving from moving a concept, moving a practice from one side to another, and therefore adapting it to the conditions in which you are trying to sort of put it to work. So part and parcel of the aftermath of the defeat, so to speak, is a thinking and more, and you know, a thinking about modeling, but also a thinking about, you know, what was called then the Arabization of Marxism, the Arab Marxia, which was influenced by Mao Zedong's Chinification of Marxism, but also by uh, thinkers like Fanon, who are stretched, they cannot really be applied. So the idea of thinking, you know, that, that I'm trying to give you a sense of the kind of um, 
the effervescence and vitality and also conflicting nature of the arguments that were put so to speak, in the wake in the, in, in, in the wake of defeat. Let me add, you know, let me add that there is something, uh, you know, something more personal that has to do with uh, the question of the very... Fadi, where are How is the... Your voice is, yeah, we're losing you. Okay. And can you hear me now? Yes, now it's better. Yeah, and maybe you want to conclude okay. this part. Uh, yeah, just like, right, cut, 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 me, cut me off if, if uh, you know, if basically I'm cut, breaking again. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to finish by thinking about how is it that the 67 defeat one can see consequences of it and traces of it in thinkers who were not present geographically there and had sort of the impact of the defeat, so to speak, mediated by different layers. Mm. Uh, so let me end by, th and, and these thinkers, uh, I mean, I have in mind two diasporic thinkers, uh, one Edward Said and the other one is Talal Asan. So I will end by reading a small excerpt of how Talal Asad, uh, in a way, thought about the impact of the, the defeat and the gener and you know how we can think about how defeat generated critical agendas by thinking about the personal experience. So, so Asad says, 1967 was an enormous watershed in my life. Intellectualish, which astounded me. I couldn't get over the countries. Joy expressed in TV and newspaper reports and in photographs. I still have some of these, as it says, at the thousands of humiliated, exhausted peasant soldiers forced to walk barefoot over the hot desert. I could understand the joy that Israelis must have felt at their victory, but the English, what was the emotion that fueled exaltation of this enlightened nation toward the ignominious defeat of a wretched, oppressed Oriental people? And I will conclude by the, this last line from Assad. This question began as a rhetorical one for me, but slowly it pushed me to rethink the assumptions I had for so long carried with me about rationality and justice in politics. Thank you. Thank you, Fadi. Um, so Fadi, I removed my video because you were, your connection was not great all the time. And so I think when this happens again, maybe we can all remove our videos uh, just to give, if that helps. I don't know if it helps, but, <laughs> um, but thank you. Um, Paloma. And I should remind everyone that we have many questions already in the Q&A. So let's try to stick to five minutes for each question so that we can get um, to the questions from the audience and you will have more opportunity to speak. Go ahead, Paloma, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Samia, for your question. And thank you, Fali, once again. Um, I would present, uh, it, it, and, and maybe a redu in a reductionistic way, the opposite moment where the political success implies, if not a, a failure of theories, theorization, at least an interruption of theorization about socialism, uh, right? And I have two exhibits to illustrate sort of the way I approach this question, one revisionist, if you will, and one presentist, but I think the second one I'll talk about in the next question. Um, so the first move I would like to propose here then is for this post-socialist moment um, that I've been describing as an opportunity uh, to reread a tradition of critique and engagement with the successful case, uh, actually socialism, to engage with it from the left, a position explicitly theorized by the likes of Raya Dunayevskaya, C.L.R. James, Cornelius Castoriadis, um, 
And for example, I've been reading the correspondence between Dunayevskaya and Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse, a key referent of the Western, uh, certainly North American uh, New Left, who promoted Cuba as a viable socialist alternative as late as 1968. Uh, December 1968, after Cuba had supported the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, after the revolutionary government had finished the full statization of agricultural land and the economy. And as early as 1961, um, Detroit labor activist uh, Dunevskaya, who was a, a Detroit labor activist, a translator, a Hegelian autodidact scholar, Dunevskaya uh, warned Marcuse in letter um, that while the 1959 Cuban Revolution and the 1917 Russian Revolution were not the same uh, event, were not the same phenomenon, she considered that the theoretical and political position of the new left intellectuals vis-a-vis -vis that takeover of the state apparatus by a vanguard party um, was following a similar and similarly dangerous um, um, pattern, historical pattern, uh, something that Dunayevskaya, for example, read as both a theoretical and a personal failure by the very intellectual community, the new left invested in revising Stalinist orthodoxies, right? Um, so now, for example, a lot has been written about the travels uh, of Western intellectuals to Cuba and their relationship to Cuban socialism from the 60s onward. To go back to the original or to the initial theme about traveling and going before it changed, right? So a lot has been written about that relationship. But the consensus is that, well, they were divided into camps. Um, one, the, the ones who publicly supported until the end the model, the Cuban model, either because they were duped or they were romantic or they were opportunists or because they thought um, it was a strategically um, important position that the benefits uh, of the Cuban revolution outweighed its negative features, right? That's the one camp um, because it was still closer to a worker state. And the other camp, uh, this is the consensus, right? In which that relationship has been read, the other camp was the ones who were initially hopeful, uh, but after 1971, when there is a big public episode of censorship, of cultural censorship of the poet Everto Padilla um, by the revolutionary government, uh, this camp was initially uh, committed. And then after this moment, so goes the narrative, broke with that commitment, but not because Cuba was not socialist, but because of the record of the government in political and cultural repression alone. So what I'm proposing to read this other tradition of the, the post-socialist moment as a way to, to read this other tradition of dissent from the left um, is because I want to move through, but also beyond the psychoaffective uh, investment in success of these new left intellectuals. Um, and actually to look at it uh, from the theoretical point of view as a theoretical uh, uh, failure or interruption with actually existing socialism. And that has to do with two things in, in depending on who we are talking about, um, whether the transformations on consciousness uh, spoke to the sort of cultural stern of the new left. Uh, and I'm not gonna say a lot about that today, but I'll talk a little bit about this other tradition of uh, analyzing and engaging with actually existing socialism from the strictly materialist point of view, right? Um, which is seldom featured in this standard intellectual history in this consensus of analyzing the relationship between Western intellectuals and Cuba. So for example, I'm, I'm, I'm writing about René Dumont, a French agronomist who doesn't really fit these narratives, who's very seldom talked about, who goes to Cuba as a foreign technician in the 60s and writes extensively about the distinction between statization and socialization. He was accused of being a CIA asset and ignored and dismissed and very seldom read. Um, but for example, based on his study of Cuban agrarian reforms in detail from like the fertility of the soil, <laughs> the distribution of bananas, Based on his study, what he describes from a socialist perspective is that um, the transformations introduced 
by the revolutionary government after 1959, like privileging state farms over cooperatives, the suppression of self-management and unionization, um, and so on and so forth. These changes were not in fact socialist, argues Dumont, Mm -hmm. um, but closer to a form of militarized state capitalism, where the workers and the peasants do not have democratic control of the means of production and become the salaried employers of the bureaucratic machine. Now, Dumont's writing is going to anticipate, um, is going to anticipate, for example, um, Moish Moishe Postone's more recent reconsideration of Marxian economics, um, because Dumont demonstrates through his cultural research, uh, sorry, through his agricultural research, that the elimination of the bourgeois mode of distribution, the market mechanisms, does not translate into the elimination of the capitalist mode of production, as Postone argues that in fact it serves to veil the presence of capital in so-called actually existing socialism. Um, and, and the way these early economic and, and political transformations in Cuba were unquestionably perceived to be exceptional and completely different from earlier Soviet models. Um, and later, the stark difference between Cubans' foreign and domestic policies, international solidarity and national repression, these elements turn Cuban socialism into this dual uh, entity, a symbolic contested space and a, and a, and a social reality. And, and how that is read in this uh, sort of media archive, both from the present um, in Cuba and from the uh, global media archive about Cuban socialism that repeats some of these uh, more conventional narratives and ignore, ignores some of these um, alternative engagements. Um, what it produces is a, a, a schism. Um, on one hand, Cuba become, Cuban socialism uh, becomes an empty signifier, to use Ernesto Laclau's language, an empty signifier um, through which an international left imaginary recognize uh, and it still does its collective dreams of unorthodox, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist self-determination. Um, but it also, it, it, it exists, it functions uh, Cuban socialism as a signifier, as a, as a signifier in crisis at the moment. Um, from the from the domestic point of view, uh, against which the national constituents um, must really present their own personal dreams of self determination. Uh, so um, that's why I, I insist on the post socialist moment, not only to engage with actually existing socialism, but also to reread a tradition of dissent from the left that has been uh, read in other contexts, but from which Cuba has continues to be excluded. So in, in, so in a way, it, it, it presents a, a, an opposite situation to the one Fadi was just talking about, where this political success generates a kind of theoretical defeat uh, to, to think beyond it. Thank you, Paloma. Thank you, Wazad, also that last clarifying sentence. Nuri, unmute yourself and go for it. Nuri, you're still muted. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, I don't, I'm trying to share my uh, screen again. Although, uh, yeah, so, um, so what, what I want to talk about now is really um, the ways in which I think um, the military defeats, of course, I mean, as, as Fadi mentioned, uh, they were seen by the new left as the defeat of the regimes, but, um, to a certain extent, of course, the culture that was uh, being uh, produced uh, at the time and that was uh, grappling uh, with, you know, the Nakba and then the um, the Naxa, I mean, uh, was not really, I mean, insulated from those defeats. So it 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 had, in other words, it it felt the heat of those defeats and it had to um, 
to work with it or to grapple with it um, uh, in such a way that it, it, it could really work through it or, or come to terms with it or, and, and surpass it uh, to a, cer a certain extent. And what I noticed, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, about Arabic literature and culture in general <clears throat> is this, um, this really a work on, on form and work on, on, on language. I mean, when uh, somebody like Amir Habibi uh, chooses a title for his novel called Al Mutasha'al, <laughs> clearly, uh, Al Mutasha'al, which means, you know, the pessimist. Uh, <laughs> Is optimist. So it's uh, this combination of pessimism and optimism. So clearly you have here a novelist who's really trying to think through the, the you know, to think through this experience of, uh, of defeat and, and to think about it in, in linguistically, conceptually, okay? So, so in other words, uh, there is one dimension of the culture that tried to grapple um, 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 with, with the experience of defeat at the level of language. So it was thought as, as something that you know, we have to work on language. And, and for instance, if we think about Mahmoud Darwish, he has an entire project of really re uh, revisiting and revising uh, the Arabic idiom. You know, he, he says, you know, the Arabic idiom is so obsolete, it has to be transplanted into the present. Uh, so that's why, for instance, he comes up with this uh, very beautiful expression, you know, tusbihuna ala watan, which basically means, you know, may you wake up on a homeland. Um, you know, so so normally, normally when we, we say in Arabic tusbihuna uh, ala khair, which means you know uh, may um, good night basically, um, but he he actually changed that that idiom. You know, the, he actually uh, um, <clears throat> um, re-semanticized and, and included the word watan, which stands for homeland, uh, and then the expression becomes a little bit awkward in Arabic. But uh, but for some reason, it has become very popular and actually very famous. And, uh, we, you know, we use it even among friends, you know, which means uh, it's almost like saying or so that, you know, um, that, that, you know, uh, for, for Arabs or for Palestinians in particular, to have a homeland has become almost the condition for the continued relevance of the expression, may you, may, you know, good night or may you, uh, you know, may you stay healthy. Uh, Etc. So, so here, I mean, just that's just one example. There are plenty of examples uh, where the work on, on on language, the work on media, uh, the work on on the idiom uh, in particular, uh, because uh, most of the this optim well, most of this, um, <laughs> I was almost going to say optimism, but most of the grappling with defeat and trying to really open it up and surpass it uh, is materialized uh, in a sense through language. Okay, so that's one of the things. There is another dimension which, which I found also very intriguing which, and very common, um, which is this question of allegorization, you know, the ways in which, uh, you, you know, you allegorize defeat. And I think that started um, um, most remarkably with, um, you know, with this uh, novella, very, very famous novella by uh, Rassan Kanafani, Rijal uh, Shams or Man in the Sun. And the ending of that novella is very uh, important. Um, because, uh, you know, um, very briefly, I mean, the novella is about these uh, three men who went to uh, Iraq and then from there were smuggled to Kuwait in a, in a water tanker. And then, of course, they, they die in the water tanker. And um, um, the driver, who is himself um, a Palestinian uh, from the 48th War, and, um, and um, he, he was uh, castrated and um, uh, he's impotent. Uh, he was the leader, he was the, the driver. And um, he, at the end, he throws them on the, um, um, on, uh, you know, he piles them on, um, um, uh, on, the, on the side of the, of the street so that they may be found and, uh, and collected. Um, the question that has been um, most discussed uh, about that novel is that uh, when, um, when the three, um, three Palestinians in the water tanker, that when they were suffocating to death, they didn't knock on the tank. And, and so that has actually compelled uh, uh, Tawfiq Saleh, uh, an Egyptian uh, uh, filmmaker, to make a film. When he made the film about Men of the Sun, he changed the, uh, the ending. He made, these, um, he made the, uh, the three Palestinians knock on the, uh, on, on the tanker because, because the, you know, he wanted to show that uh, you know, the, the, the Palestinians were not just, you know, uh, disposable objects, but, you know, they had agency and they, you know, and if they're suffocating, then 
they would have to do something. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, you know so the, here's the pictures here from the film, a man without a homeland um, will have no grave in the earth. Um, I have a clip here, but again, you know, the, for the sake of time, um, um, I will not. I will not play it. But I think what, what what I'm trying to say here about this novella is that really what most readers and critics missed is that uh, the novella itself does the knocking. It's not. It's not really the. Uh, so it, it, it's not because the knocking <laughs> does not occur in the novel. It's really the the, the novel itself uh, is the, is that act of of, of knocking. Is you know the is it's that literary act that actually performs. Uh, that knocking and that um, that also allegorizes the ways in which um, the you know the the defeat has become transnational by transnational here I mean um, between the Arab nations uh, I mean the the Arab world in, uh, in particular so um, um, so I, I find that very um, um, one of the ways of allegorizing the defeat um, my next example would uh, bring us to um, um, uh, Nouri Bouzid, he, uh, you know, he made this film in, uh, in 87, um, which is called Man of Ashes, or uh, Rih al-Sid, and, and um, uh, this, I mean, uh, while Kanafani's novel ends with that allegory of the uh, defeated um, image of the Palestinians thrown on, on, on the pile of history and the ways in which uh, that um, is, is actually an indictment of the Arab regimes, or, or, or of, you know, and of course of the um, um, Israeli occupiers um, at the same time. But uh, Bouzid's film starts with uh, with um, starts with um, um, an almost like an epigraph, a very very quick sequence, in which you have um, a red rooster um, um, slaughtered and then thrown there, and then um, um, and then of course. Uh, the, the rooster will run before um, he drops dead, and I think the 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 that that whole uh, that whole sequence, which is very short, uh, condenses for Bouzid, uh, you know, the 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 this this afterlife, as as, as Fadi mentioned, this afterlife of, of the cat, you know, the, the you know, or the this afterlife of defeat and the ways in which. Um, you know what happens in that in that meanwhile after the event. You know, and uh, and it feels like for the characters, uh, for Bouzid's characters in this film, it feels that their entire life is that in between the cat and the dropping dead. You know, I mean, of course, that moment, of course, in the in the case of the rooster, that's like a few seconds or sometimes you know a minute or or, or what have you, but. But uh, Bouzid makes it span a, an entire uh, lifetime, just to show you the the extent to which you know the trauma uh, is is going to be there and is going to be present. Um, you know, the, so it, uh, and and the the history of his characters becomes really marked uh, by the the experience of rape they 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 undergo, and 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 so this question of rape, which also um, uh, for Bouzid is um, is an allegory for speaking about the defeat of sixty seven. Uh, because you know he says that very clearly in a in an article he calls you know the defeat conscious cinema, um, and um, you know it, it's it's almost like a manifesto for his uh, auteur filmmaking. And in in that in that article actually he um, he shows the ways in which uh, the defeat has changed the ways in which he as a filmmaker um, um, goes about uh, in in his art. For instance, there is no no more happy ending. Um, you know, the, there is um, there is uh, there is no more like um, um, this heroic image of of um, of, of, of Arab um, protagonist uh, on on screen. Um, he in in all his films, uh, the, you know, defeat has become like a, one of the constant signatures uh, of his filmmaking. And and of course, the films do not romanticize defeat, but uh, but it it tries to to actually. Um, uh, visualize it and and by making it present to audiences as 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 a spectacle in a sense it 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 opens the space for uh, identification empathy and hopefully for also you know uh, surpassing uh, the experience of defeat of course at at a distance um, I think one of the things that uh, I should add here is 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 the ways in which um, the ways in which you know this defeat of sixty seven. 
um, 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 of course, of course, it is it is it is a, a defeat of the um, the it is a military defeat and it is a defeat of the regimes, uh, etc. But at the same time, I think um, one of the things that uh, that becomes clear is that um, many people speak about the ways in which you know this defeat has become itself generative. Of course, you know it's I mean Fadi has mentioned that it's generative, productive in the sense that it has produced literature, it has produced philosophies, but the defeat itself has become generative. In other words, it has generated and, and bred um, uh, other defeats. So from 67, we go to 78, we go to Oslo, we go to, you know, the second Intifada, and then we go to, and, and so on and so forth. And even, you know, the, the, the hope that we had with the Arab uprising was, 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 uh, was very soon, um, you know, uh, derailed. And I hear, I just want to use this opportunity to read this uh, citation from Darwish, which I find really uh, quite ironic and quite interesting. And he says this in one of his really, the, the, um, um, you know, in a book um, that was recently translated. So um, he says, one defeat follows another, yet the Arabs celebrate all their holidays. You wonder, the days erase our days due to all holidays and occasions. Is there a single day left in the calendar for a victory? All the days are reserved for coups and counter coups, and all of them are official holidays. There you find the reason for your never ending defeats. But if you were to find an open day in the calendar, then we would be victorious. And then, you know, he has another, um, uh, another very short uh, quote from the Trace of the Butterfly or Athar al Farasha. We like remembering June on its 40th anniversary. If we don't find somebody to defeat us again, we will defeat ourselves with our own hands so that we don't forget. So you see this, this, you know, this, this, uh, this understanding, uh, and of course, you know, there is Faisal Daraj who also spoke about, you know, al hazim al mutawalida, which means, you know, the generative reproductive defeat. And so, you know, the, the, the this has been um, obviously uh, a space for irony, sarcasm, you may call it, but at the same time, it has also been. Um, um, uh, you know, it, 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 I think what it, what it tries to show is that 67 is now. It's like the, this defeat or, or the Nakba is now. It is still going on. It's not, it's, it, it, it has not ended. So, um, so I think um, in the end, it's really compelling us to do something uh, in the present. It's not, it's not of the past, in other words. And, and it's not because after, uh, its after effects are still uh, alive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nouri. Thank you. So defeat is an opportunity for translation as opposed to modeling um, or another situation of the interruption um, of theorization about socialism, um, as in uh, Paloma's uh, intervention. Um, and the failure, really, the theoretical failure accompanied with the political success. And then with Nouri also, we've we're, we're getting a sense of the space that is opened up and that is perhaps captured in the cinema of Bouzid, um, the space between defeat and the dropping dead, but there is space nevertheless. And that space is, is, is what um, Van der Wish also prop is, is capturing on the calendar, um, if we can find that moment. So let me then turn to the third question um, that we, with which we will conclude this conversation. And uh, we are running way, 30 minutes late, something like that. So let's try to restrict ourselves so that we can, people can remain with us. My third question then is how are we to think the future from the past and present of ongoing defeats? And is, if defeat is not necessarily the equivalent of despair, as all of you were really suggesting, might reckoning with defeat be the condition of possibility of other futures, indeed, other world? I think all of you have been addressing this question so far, so maybe just conclude some of your thoughts. Uh, this is an opportunity to just bring some of your thinking together in relation to this question. Fadi. Uh, thank you, Samir. I would like to actually uh, start the conclusion by uh, picking up on what Nuri said about the different generativity of defeat. And then uh, there is, I think, you know, if one thinks about the different um, 
ways in which 1967 had had afterlives uh, and also how uh, what Nuri was talking about in terms of the stringing of different defeats in its wake one realizes that there is there is a hegemonic uh, mythological language in in uh, the practice of uh, contemporary and modern arab intellectuals which could be sort of like summarized into uh, the three n's letter n which is basically uh, nahda nakba naksa so Nahda as in revival, renaissance, Nakba as in catastrophe, calamity, and Naksa as in setback. And, and I try to do some critical work against uh, this uh, language, which I really think works like a mythology in the levi sense, like a frame that basically gives some kind of meaning to big events without necessarily diagnosing them. So, you know, 1967, for example, was called uh, a second Nakba, but it was also called the end point of the uh, second Nahda. So what we have here, I mean, Nuri was talking about uh, the allegorization of defeat, but we, what we have here is also thinking of defeat as a metonymy thinking of the military defeat as a metonymy for the defeat of Arab modernity, the defeat of Arab culture, the defeat of uh, Nuri was mentioning George Tarabishi. George Tarabishi says that, you know, the Arabs witnessed a first collective neurosis when Napoleon invaded them. And then they basically experienced a second collective neurosis in the wake of 67. So, so there is something in there is something I'm not at ease with in this, in, in, in basically a the deployment of this mythological language of like Nahda Nakba Naksa, which at the same time takes something like 67 uh, as a turning point, as a singular event, but also as a contemporary expression of a deeper structure of defeat. And and Nuri was gesturing to that when he mentioned Faisal Darraj does that. And, and so does uh, Tarabishi in a way. So basically 67 is a crucial singular event, yet it is at the same time resuming the defeat of the Arabs against Napoleon after in, you know, in the 18th century. So there is, there is at the same time structure and event that are basically played, you know, played together in, in that rereading of the past that you asked about. So Abdel Nasser becomes Muhammad Ali Basha, the ruler of Egypt, and the Israelis, so to speak, are the modern French expedition in, in one way or another. Uh, so let me go back by to conclude, to start my conclusion by going back to, uh, I think, the Adorno's insight about what gets dropped when you only write the history, when, in terms of the dialectic of victory and defeat, what gets left on the wayside. And I think, you know, part of what gets left on the wayside is a major event that cannot be mapped on the coordinates of the national question. Yeah. I.e. events that are not anti-colonial or anti-imperial that do not have the West at their center or Israel at their center. And this is crucial, I think, to what you're asking about, because I do think that if we want to reread our history in the wake of the Arab revolutions, one cannot repeat this mythological language of Nahda, Nakba, Naksa, which, is, which always has as its referent an external enemy, whether it is colonialism, imperialism, or or Israel. And I, I'll give a small example that I write a bit about, which is uh, a, a very important event that is rarely written about, which is basically the rupture of the union between Egypt and Syria in 1961. And that rupture was essential in 
moving a generation of Arab nationalist militants into Marxism. This, this event is rarely written about. It is the first important, you can call it defeat of Arab nationalism in practice. Because it's an ideology that sort of, you know, was pushing the fact that when the colonizer leaves, the colonizer that the colonizer that divides Arabs leaves, then the Arabs are going to unite. So they mm -hmm. unite and the, the whole thing doesn't last more than three years. So this kind of event is completely erased by the over the sort of over determination, over determined nature of that dialectic of victory and defeat that is basically mapped onto the national axis. Like how can we reread our history? without necessarily over-determining it through the national question. Mm -hmm. I think this is a crucial, you know, this is a crucial workshop, chantier, you know, a crucial workshop to be done in the wake of uh, the Arab revolutions. Let me end on two notes which have nothing to do with the Arab world. Okay. And nothing to do with the left, and they're very, very tentative. There are two observations. You know, you so you ask about whether reckoning with defeat has to, you know, is sort of a condition of possibility for other futures. And again, I'm on, I'm on very tentative grounds, but I would like to hear what people think about this. It seems to me that the vocabulary of defeat is no longer as salient today as it was mm -hmm. on different registers. So if you think of something like the war on terror, yeah. we're not sure if in that war on terror, there are victors and there are defeated basically parties. And whether the parties that even are defeated are going to declare their defeat or the parties that are victors are going to defeat. So there is a way in which thinking about the nature of defeat and military wars, I think, is being transformed into a protracted kind of, you know, ongoing war in the way in which, you know, uh, there are some medical anthropologists who have made an argument about how our relationship to health and to illness has changed. I mean, uh, Joseph Dumit in a book called Drugs for Life talked about in a way how now the notion of health and illness is sort of basically you're, is on a spectrum. You're no longer either sick or healthy, but you're always on something, so to speak. So there is that, that idea of a clear cut binary is gone. The second point, and I'll end there. So the first is the question of, of, you know, thinking about the new forms of war, new forms of enemies, etc. The second point has to do with the hegemony of uh, the new language of the psychology of resilience. And there is, there is that whole dominant language now, which is post about the necessity to be resilient in the face of adversity. Uh, and the American Psychological Association sort of like defines resilience as adapting well to trauma, to tragedy, and also the ability to bounce, to bounce back. And in bouncing back, you become stronger. Now, it seems to me that the, the elasticity that is implied in the concept of resilience is in tension with the notion of defeat, which etymologically has to do with being undone. Mm -hmm. It comes from French, old French and Latin, and it's basically when you're defeated in a way, you are undone. You may be, you know, undone forever, or you may be able to recompose yourself. But I think that there is something here in the language of resilience that is more and more hegemonic. And then you see sort of pushed sometimes, you know, in the wake of large catastrophes, like the uh, explosion that shattered Beirut on August 
in August this year, or in other, you know, in other dire situations where people are sort of pushed to be resilient. Like they're not permitted, so to speak, to be defeated and mm -hmm. to sort of like think about what does that entail? Thank you. Thank you, Fadi. Thank you. Um, Paloma? Yeah, Samira, thanks, uh, Fadi. Uh, so uh, my, my conclusion responds to both your question, Samira, about uh, the stakes for the present, uh, but also in a way uh, to Fadi's uh, comment just now about what, 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 what falls outside of those uh, narratives. And in addition to opening up from the present to other intellectual genealogies, parallel or outside of the new left, uh, I look at cultural representations and media representations of Cuban post-socialism, um, where, where, where uh, we can see, for example, the dreams and demands of constituencies that really toil uh, beneath and also beyond the pressures and alliances of, of, of global markets and, and nation states. Um, and so I'm interested, you know, in, in, a in, in, in a tradition of cultural studies that analyzes the terrain as it appears and in and in moments where uh, desires are articulated even when they do not appear recognizable as as radical utopian desires or as political interventions right in popular mass culture and digital culture for example no uh, so i'm looking at like the homemade advertising of the informal economy where the competition between the state and everyday citizens appears uh in the struggle as the transnational markets expands for example and i'll share quickly an image um that i think summarizes a lot of this um problems, at least in the context I'm looking at. Um, and uh, it's four images in one. Um, and I'll say this, um, the image of Chess defeated body, which advertised the seminar um, on the left corner, upon his death was substituted very quickly in the global imaginary in 1967 with a famous Corda photograph, the Guerrillero Heroico, it's called the Heroic Guerrilla Fighter, when, when the, the Bolivian diary was published and then later in posters um, in the 1968 revolt. So this is the image we know of, 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 of uh, victory. More recently in Obama, with, during Obama's visit to Cuba in 2016, the memescape, which is one of the sites I'm looking at, produced an anonymous user-generated image that I call the Obama Heroico, the heroic Obama, which is in the lower right-hand corner. Um, and and um, seemingly it's just a satirical commentary on the mutually beneficial new accords between the Cuban and the American government signed in 2014. Um, but this meme also performed a critique, I would argue, of the limitations of these political conversations to offer any substantive um, change uh, to, to everyday citizens. Um, in the meme, for example, the similarity between Che and Obama as, as either failed messiahs or false prophets, I think, becomes more legible. Uh, in, in, in that humorous or satirical engagement with those images. Um, and uh, as, as and their differences as respective icons of socialism, capitalist utopias um, for the present are actually rendered uh, almost irrelevant, that difference. Um, the phrase, interesting, talking about political grammar, <laughs> and in this case, actual grammar, uh, the phrase onto, on, on their chess sculpture, which is in the Revolution Plaza, um, until victory always is a phrase from his letter of uh, goodbye to Cuba. Um, and the phrase under Obama's meme, no es fácil, it means it's not easy, a phrase in Cuban Spanish that means frustration and impotence in an intractable situation, and was a phrase that Obama misused and mispronounced in his speech in Cuba. Um, so that's why it's also there as part of the meme. These two phrases also become uh, interchangeable, no? A frustration and hasta la victoria siempre, they cancel each other. And I think that that poses the question for me that was also the question of the transnational left of the 60s and you, what is the alternative? Uh, as Fadi mm, made reference to this a little earlier. And, and I will conclude by saying this, um, 
there is a lot of remarkable work that has emerged in the Latin American context um, around ecological feminist indigenous critiques of the, of the of pink tide governments from Chavez to Morales for their uh, neo extractivist developmentalism, for their record on indigenous communities, on women, on LGBTQ rights, on state sanctioned violence, um, or what Raquel Gutierrez Aguilar has called in the Bolivian context, macho partidismo pseudo plurinacional, pseudo plurinational macho partidism, as a critique to this uh, sort of status obsession or this uh, impossibility to let go. Uh, of, of this image of the Cuban model or its or its afterlives. And the other day I was just at a talk and a, a notable Latin American anthropologist said, oh, they will crucify me for saying this, but the Cuban model doesn't work. But I'm, I was interested more in the, they will crucify me for this. Um, somehow uh, the, to say, as my colleague lamented, that Cuba is not an exception uh, in Latin America, in the Latin American context, at least, that is not the absence of capitalism, but the presence of a differently organized uh, form of capital accumulation is still somehow a heretical proposition. And, and, and there is still very little will to distinguish, uh, even in, among academics, between the denunciation of the American imperialism and of the Cold War liberal triumphalism of the end of history from then on the other hand, the necessary critique of the Cuban government or vice versa. So I think to go back to the um, earlier point about the intellectual genealogy, the old dissidents of the left like Dunayevskaya and Dumont that I talked about earlier, they teach us among other things for the present, for the future, to be as vigilant against red washing as we are against red baiting, to put it brutally, uh, that in fact, the longer we refuse to recognize what the alternative to capitalism does not look like, the more difficult it will be to uh, really invest in other vocabularies of social and ecological justice that are critical of received ideas about actually existing socialism, critical of the capitalist present in all its modalities, um, and in a way responsive to, to, to the recalcitrant demands of a future that hails us to do better. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, thank you, Paloma, thank you. I should say that there are many, um, many parallels between your work and Fadi's work on the Arab world precisely on, on such questions and including dissidents um, of the left. Um, Nuri. Thank you. I'll try to be brief given that uh, I can see many questions. And, uh, um, okay, I'll try. Uh, I think um, your, your question about how to, um, how to go from here or the future, I think this is not, of course, a new question. I mean, it, it's, it's been asked, uh, it's, been a, it's, it's, it's as if, you know, it's, um, um, I don't know, it's been asked so many times that I can't even um, begin, you know, to imagine where to start. I think one of the early things that um, somebody like Ghassan Kanafani tried, uh, with whom I've, I feel obsessed these days, <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the things he, he tried in uh, Return to Haifa, Rajou ala Haifa, I think what, I mean, it's not, of course, it, it's not, um, you know, clarified um, um, uh, philosophically. Uh, and that's why actually part of the, I mean, part of the reason why I like working on these questions in relation to culture and literature, it's because part of uh, how to deal with defeat is partly analytical. It's partly what we bring to it. Like it, it's a work of analysis, in other words, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's really that, that, uh, that moment of reflection and that moment of uh, deconstructing the concept and that mo it, it's a change also of perception. And w the more you think about it, the more perhaps your perception of it, you know, changes or swerves actually, which is uh, a word that I like. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that kind of funny tries, uh, um, you know, he submits the thesis that we, we are, you know, especially, you know, when it comes to Palestine, the context is, is, is very politicized, you know. And so one of the things he tries in return to Haifa, um, I mean, uh, if I say very quickly, it's, uh, it's really um, the return of this uh, return to Haifa is, is about this Palestinian family who've been expelled for, you know, 48 Palestinian family expelled. And then they go back to, um, to the um, 48 
um, uh, after the, um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, there is a sub story to this because the defeat of 67 um, was actually also, uh, it, it's interesting because it has reunited Palestine. So that's another, you know, satirical thing, which Amil Habibi like makes a career out of. Um, it's it's uh, it, it's interesting that uh, only after another defeat that Palestinians can actually visit each other. So that that 67 defeat is quite um, quite compelling in that regard. So this family revisits um, because when they left in in 48, they left their son in their house, and so uh, after 67, when the borders opened, they go and revisit. And of course, their son was raised up by this um, you know um, Polish couple. And he was raised up to be to become a Zionist, and he's actually in the military, etc. And his name is Dov. Um, uh, and so, what you know, what what kind of funny tries in the dialogue between uh, Said and Dov is is really try to depoliticize, you know, the 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 very politicized, uh, you know, the 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 politicized situation. Try to depoliticize it, and then in order to repoliticize and rehumanize it. Because I think that's what he tries in that in that in that novella, which is very intriguing and very compelling, and he tries to open up the question of defeat, which is in this case a, a particularly Palestinian defeat, open it up, um, uh, try, you know, um, making it into like a human and humanistic question, and and this becomes like a trace that actually Darwish himself builds on. Because one of the things that Darwish says is, you know, especially in his later poetry, is that I'm the last Trojan poet. So he actually goes back to the early story of defeat, you know, the Trojan Wars, uh, and and that early story, and 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 trying to really put the Palestinian, um, you know, uh, defeat on on a universal, universalistic level. And he tried that even before when he was speaking about, you know, I'm the son of the two Edens, which you know, and by the first Eden he means Andalusia, you know, Andalus. and then of course uh, uh, Palestine, and and so he he goes back, you know. Um, Earlier, like uh, you know, in the 90s, he went back to Andalus to 19 for um, no uh, 1492. But then, in his later poetry, he actually widened the scope, widened the scope, and he 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 had a big um, uh, reflection on on Troy and uh, him being the last Trojan poet. And this really also combines with one thing that Elias Hori has said, which is the story belongs to the defeated, um, um, but history belongs to the victor. And I think that's a very compelling, uh, you know, sentence that really meshes together uh, the, the different directions that you know that we see uh, materializing, especially in Arabic literature and culture. I mean, one of the things that I wanted also to to speak about um, in relation, really, to um, uh, you know, to the defeat is is the question: What is it that was defeated? Is it an object that has uh, that that you know uh, has been uh, fully obtained? First of all, I mean. Because most of the time we speak about the defeat of Arab nationalism, but has Arab nationalism? I mean, <laughs> Fadi was speaking about the, the first experiment of Arab nationalism, which is the the United Republic, uh, you know, which which really just you know survived for three years, uh, and that was an experiment. So it, it's not like Arab national. The, this notion of the United Arab Nation, it's not like it has been a project that has been fulfilled and then has been defeated or has been lost. I mean, there was an attempt between Libya and Tunisia. There were many, you know, many experiments which really did not work. So in a sense, what has been defeated is not even an object that has been fulfilled to start with. What has been defeated, in fact, is the promise of something that may happen. It, it's really, the, I mean, it, it, and we can't even say that it's the promise that has been defeated, but the, the project itself has been a promise, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not like it, 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 it's an object that has been, uh, you know, that has been obtained. So in a sense, the defeat in particular, the, this, defeat, this particular defeat of 67 is about, you know, the loss of something. Uh, I mean, if it's a loss, if it's a defeat, it's, it's about something incomplete. So it's not really something that we can, um, you know, we can work through and reach closure because, because it has not totally disappeared in a way. And so that's why we're suspended. So that's why the aftermath is kind of interesting because we're suspended. We don't know how to work through with that with that promise because it hasn't been totally, you know, totally defeated. It's it's still there. It's still, you know. Um, um, and actually, I don't understand why um, there is no more up, operas. I mean, I'm used to um, every decade we usually have an uh, an opera of an Arab dream, you know, uh, um, from Julia Boutras to to you know the the 90s and the the early 2000s. Um, but recently, probably with the derailment of the Arab uprising, I don't know what happened. 
So I think, you know, uh, in a sense, I, I would say two, two words to, to end, um, you know, want to end on an um, optimistic note. Of course, you know, Nori Bouzid, in his work, he mentions this notion of the, uh, the right to failure, which is, you know, if you, if you fail, you know, uh, which he takes, I mean, I understand he takes it from Beckett. It's if you fail, fail better. And, and, and so he comes up, um, I mean, he, he really kind of, um, in his writings and his films, he works with this concept so that we do have a right to, you know, we have the right to fail. I mean, we try, and here he's speaking particularly about his involvement with this perspective, AFAP, you know, uh, leftist movement in Tunisia and the ways in which they were all imprisoned, like all the communists also in Nasser from 59 to, to 64. Um, all these leftist communist movements who have been, you know, there has been a clampdown on, on them by all the uh, authoritarian regimes. And the ways he, the way he think about it is really, um, um, is really simply as saying, you know, we have the right to fail and we have the right to try. So then we can try again. And, and actually after saying that, after like five years in prison, uh, he, come, he comes back and he starts uh, an entire uh, new career in, uh, in cinema. And one of the things also that um, uh, I want to mention in relation to um, another um, uh, intellectual um, uh, whom I really think is, is really important, uh, Saadallah Wanous. And I think in, in, in one, I mean, Saadallah Wanous has, has himself a very in, uh, important and interesting story, given his multiple attempts of, uh, of suicide. Um, um, and um, in, in his last, well, uh, in, in a speech he gave um, uh, in 95, he says this really very memorable um, um, uh, citation, uh, we are condemned to hope and what is happening today cannot be the end of history. And, and so he, he said this in, in, that, in that context of, of course, the context of the, uh, the context of the 90s of, you know, these, of all these theories about the end of history, the end of the dialectic in, in a sense, you know, now there is only one history. And, you know, uh, and uh, Saadallah Wanu says this as someone who himself actually uh, really made, made a, 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 a genuine attempt at suicide in, in 78, um, 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 when, uh, when Sadat visited uh, the Knesset, uh, visited Israel. Um, and then of course, um, he had that period of silence in the eighties, he didn't write anything and he came back only uh, later, um, et cetera. So, um, so in, a, in a sense, I wanna, uh, I want really, to, I mean, um, there's more I can, I can say, but I want to end with, um, with one thing that Murid Barbothi says in, um, in, 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 in one of his, um, um, uh, in one of his uh, books of poetry or Diwan, um, and I, actually it's better in Arabic, but uh, I'll try the translation. I see a wonderful dream collapse, but I do not abandon it. I mean, it, it's better in, in Arabic because here we're speaking about, I mean, this is just to link up with the, the notion of the promise uh, and the ways in which, you know, um, um, we see this promise or, or, you know, of a united Arab nation in a sense, a collapse, but we, we continue it, but it's also a dream, you know, so, so it's not something material that we're working with. And I think th those are the things that really literature and, 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 and culture, and especially imaginative um, uh, culture uh, allows you, uh, you know, um, or opens up in order for us to really think through and transcend to a certain extent, uh, the experience and the um, uh, and the crisis uh, of defeat. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this. This was um, quite rich, a very rich conversation. And perhaps the last points that we made. Some of them are. I only raise them now because some of the questions were about them in the Q and A, and that is the need to also historicize the recognition of defeat, not only historicize. The experiences of defeat but also when is it that there is what is the, what are the conditions of possibility for even defeat to emerge as a concept that mediates various experiences and this is uh, something that Fadi spoke about um, I should note here perhaps that in our larger workshop to which this conversation belongs uh, the, the title of that larger workshop is Defeat the Future and Steadfastness. And it's precisely in order mm -hmm. to offer a different, vo different vocabulary than the vocabulary of resilience because def defeat and steadfastness in our, uh, in our attempts to understand are closer and it's, it's, it's the language of resilience that blocks the
the thought of defeat. Mm -hmm. So that was one thought that emerged now from this last conversation. But also another thought is Paloma's uh, alerted us to the status logics that mediate our assessments, but also our imaginaries, our assessments of the present, our assessments of Cuba, but also our imaginaries for the future and what is it that the internationalist, the international left wants in this world and a call to, to, to break that status logic that mediates how we think of the future and, um, and therefore as the condition of possibility actually of thinking alternatives to capitalism today, <clears throat> socialism. And then finally, uh, Nuri, um, I think one point that I take from you that is re relevant to what was also said by others relates is this the suspension in time in the aftermath of defeat, a suspension that then breaks down the distinction between defeat and victory. And perhaps this is also one of the reasons why one can no longer, uh, or one of the reasons why one does not necessarily recognize defeat. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be that our contemporary moment is a moment of so many suspensions in the war on terror um, that this makes the recognition also of defeat more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to, uh, we have very little time left. We've, you guys exceeded, you know, 40 minutes beyond, but it's good. It was very rich. I'm going to take three questions only and ask each one of you to respond to one or more of them. I mean, some of them are directed specifically at a person. So I am, I apologize for everyone else that sent who sent um, a question. Uh, we have 10 minutes. I'd like to conclude this by two. And um, so I'm going to take those three questions and tell you uh, and ask you. The first question is for Blanca, is for Paloma from Blanca. I have a question regarding the use of post socialism, the concept of post socialism. I wonder to which extent its use might crystallize some experiences of defeat and hinder renewed political action. So it's the use of post-socialism and then its relationship to the concept of defeat. That's one question. I'm gonna just say all questions at once so that you can respond to them in the remaining time. I have a question from Rebecca Johnson. Oh, hi, Rebecca. To Fadi Berdewil. Uh, concluding thoughts, your concluding thoughts sp spark this question. What is the temporality of defeat? Is it always temporally, historically circumscribed, a past that has passed, as opposed to the temporality of continued revolution, perhaps? Does the victory defeat dialectic itself require this temporal circumscription? Are you all, in fact, identifying points of repeat of that point? And are you all, this is for all of you, in fact, identifying points of critique of that temporality that attempt to uncircumscribe defeat? So the last bit of the question is to all of you. I want to just conclude on one of the first, on, on perhaps one last question um, from another part of the world. When we think, for all of you, when we think of defeat, especially from revolutionary left position, do we always have the same sense of defeat? And I think many of you raised this question. So maybe it's, an, it's the time to just summarize or articulate now that you've heard others, your thoughts. So do we always have the same sense of defeat? How might we historicize defeat according to different political conjunctures? The dominant forms in which we, on the side of liberation struggles, understand it. And thanks for organizing this panel. So the last question, I think, just is an opportunity for you to also reflect on what was happening uh, in this conversation and your thoughts now that you have perhaps new thoughts also in relation to what was what has been said so i'm going to invite paloma first fadi and then nuri paloma i'm changing the order you you should go first now got it um so i'll answer blanca's question specifically thank you samira thank you blanca uh and, and then i'll yield to fadi and nuri uh, but very quickly um the, the question of post-socialism, uh, the word in a way is already there and the narrative of post-socialism as that which came after socialism uh, is what we have to work with. Uh, so my exercise would be actually 
to think about post-socialism not as the moment after socialism, but precisely the moment in which we can investigate actually as um, Catherine Verderi said it best, what was socialism and what comes next? Um, so, so that's one way to think about it. It's not about um, accepting the narrative of post-socialism is either as the end of history uh, or a feat of socialism, but actually to use it to, to, to um, uh, redefine what post-socialism is and also what socialism was. Um, for the future, always for the present and for the future. So that's one way to, to think about post-socialism differently. And the other way actually is to think about the intellectual history of the concept of post-socialism itself um, in, for example, uh, the entire uh, socialist tradition, not just the Marxist tradition or what became more uh, uh, canonically associated with a certain uh, Marxist tradition, uh, to think of the moment after socialism, full communism or whatever, depending on uh, who we're talking about, they called it from the 19th century as the moment where there is a withering of the state, even the anarchist tradition. So to go back to Samaria's question about the state, so post-socialism, um, if we actually think about the as uh, the intellectual history of thinking about what comes after socialism uh, would be to think about well how do we think uh, about the withering of the state and the problem of the state in the transition is consistently throughout the 20th century and how is it gonna wither uh, is consistently the, the the black hole of Marxist theory engaging with actually existing socialism um, so I'll, I'll leave those two approaches to post-socialism there and I'll eat to Fadi and Nuri and then I can go back uh, to answer other questions okay for the one um then I think, see, Nuri, you unmuted yourself. So do you want to go? What was the question? Do you, uh, is it the, uh, the same? I'm going to send it to you to skip you all... time. We'll start with Fadi and I'll send it to you. <laughs> Fadi, go ahead. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, first, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca Johnson for um for a very generative question about the temporality of defeat. I mean, I think I do not have a theory about the temporality of defeat yet. I, what I, what I've observed, so to speak, is that the languages in which defeat was spoken in the wake of 1967, it was spoken of as a singular event, a turning point, and basically a continuation of a string of defeats. So, so in a way to answer your question, my unease about these languages of defeat is that part is that I do think that they're not they're not diagnostic. And they're at the same time deploying defeat as literally a traumatic event that sort of undoes the subject. Yet at the same time, they're reinscribing defeat as another name for Arab modernity that for them supposedly let's say starts with the you know Napoleon's invasion of of Egypt. So there is There is a, you know, there is a past that passed, but then there is a past that keeps on generating itself and generating the present at the same time. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, the second part of your question is interesting in the sense of like thinking about it as different from the temporality of a permanent revolution. And I think what I was trying to get at is that You know, in the same way in which sometimes one can criticize militants for slogans which are similar, I mean, not similar to the permanent revolution, but slogans such as, you know, uh, the struggle always goes on, you know, uh, la, la lutte continue in French, in the sense that, in, in Jacobi's sense, that basically whatever is happening, uh, there's no point at which 
you know, a militant would concede defeat, but there's always a way through auto critique to kind of reinvent, you know, reinvent oneself. I do think that that critique can be made to critics in the Arab world of not of sort of like, you know, the struggle continues, but that the defeat continues, so to speak. Those who basically see every defeat as another piece of evidence of the original defeat, so to speak. Um, and I'm not at all, you know, I'm not at all sort of, uh, I'm very critical again of this language because uh, I think it's a metaphysical language in the sense that it sort of evacuates history, it evacuates politics, it evacuates power. There, there is a, there's an attempt here in thinking about these strings of defeats as some kind, it, I mean, defeat becomes some kind of transcendental through which you can capture basically uh, Arab modernity. Um, Thank you, Fadi. Yeah, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Nuri, I'm gonna give you the last word. Take well, it in three minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, of our audience. I mean, uh, that's a very, uh, a very, um, very difficult question. But I think I would say the following, um, um, because the, this question of time and temporality in relation to defeat, I think one of the things I, I would really caution against, which is this tendency to structuralize defeat, which means you know to, uh, f you know, somehow turn a historically specific defeat into uh, some kind of, you know, um, like a destiny or, 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 or a structure in which you have one defeat after the other. And I mentioned this, you know, by way of critique, for instance, uh, Faisal Daraj and others, um, because I think that would create in the end what Nuri Bouzid, for instance, calls this culture of defeatism, you know, because in the end, you would normalize, you would find yourself normalizing and natural, you know, you would find, you would find yourself at home with living with defeat. And I think what is, I mean, and, and, and that's why, you know, there are so many writings, uh, you know, for instance, about the Arab world, the Arab and Muslim world, um, you know, which of course think about uh, the ways in which the Arabs want to return to the glorious past and, you know, or to the first Muslim community. And they, they always tend to melancholize, what I call in, in, in this um, work I've been doing, uh, they tend to melancholize, um, you know, Arab history, you know, starting from, uh, one defeat or the other, and they look at it, when they look at it, they look at it as a string of defeats or a seriality of defeats. And so it just gives, you know, it's like a homogenous, uh, you know, a, a homogenous reading of culture. So what, what I would suggest, and this is what I tried actually to do uh, in my recent work is, you know, come up with this different concept of, you know, to melancholicize, you know, to melancholicize is, is different in the sense that you actually uh, grapple with the concept of defeat in its temporality, in the present, and try to explore the ways in which it hides underneath its structure, or its, you know, uh, otherwise, you know, undefeatable structure, these histories of injustices. And, 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 and so, you know, uh, in the end, the question of defeat is the question of justice, because we have to look at, you know, what is the, uh, what are the, in, the specific injustices that, um, you know, that umbrella concept of defeat tries also to hide. So to think always from the urgency of the moment and, and, and try not to be engulfed by the, you know, the enormity of the structure of defeatism, which, you know, could start from, you know, the Trojan Wars and, the, you know, the loss of Andalusia, etc. So then, you know, that kind of displaces everything and makes everything looks uh, normal. That's how history moves, you know, and, and we're, we're always at the receiving end of that history. And that doesn't help. So we have always to look at it in from always from you know history size i mean or melancholy size <laughs> so always try to look at it from uh, you know uh, contextualize and from a specific historical perspective and look at the ways in which you you know you can engage with the urgency of the moment that's what i would say Paloma, did you like to add something to this question because i just one phrase, uh, as Nuri was talking about melancholy uh, and the, tem the temporality question, I will quote the epigraph of Laszlo Krasna Horkai's uh, The Melancholy of Resistance. It passes, but it does not pass away. Mm. Um, mm. And, <laughs> and I think that would be a way to start thinking about the temporality, both of 
and beyond defeat and, and victory. Mm -hmm. So it passes, but it does not pass away. And with these words, I have to thank you all uh, for um, participating in this very lively and really rich conversation. And I want to thank our audience. Half of them almost stayed with you all the way until the end. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, we all look forward to future, to future conversations on this topic and related topics. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hate to end it in the Zoom-like way, but the Zoom-like way, I press the leave button. So I'm going to do it now. Thank you all. <laughs>